prisoner swaps between Russia and Ukraine, a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, the UN climate conference. What do they have in common? An Arab Gulf state was at the center of all of them. We're working to create new partnerships with everyone. The Arab Gulf states want more global influence. Sometimes that means high-fiving and fist-bumping. So this new generation of politicians, they feel very empowered. They really just want to be viewed as these modern Islamic states that, despite their small size, have reach beyond their borders. Oil and gas made the Gulf states rich and powerful, and their longtime ally, the U.S., provided security guarantees. But something is shifting. The U.S. and China are vying for global influence. Also here in the Gulf. Now the leaders of Saudi Arabia and the UAE are at a crossroads. So how are they pushing for power in a changing world? Let's map it out. Nothing screams confidence more than shiny mega projects like these, shown here in PR videos. The Line, a futuristic linear city powered by renewable energy that is designed to stretch 170 kilometers along Saudi Arabia's Red Sea coast. Or Al Dafra near the United Arab Emirates capital Abu Dhabi, touted as the world's largest single site solar plant. To understand what's going on in the Arab Gulf states, we're focusing on these two economic powerhouses, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. It's oil that made this kind of life possible here. It's made these two authoritarian monarchies wealthy. And it's helped the Gulf become a hub for global trade. Up to 30% of the world's traded oil passes through this waterway, the Strait of Hormuz. But they want more. They're pushing for political transformation. This new generation of politicians feel that they have all the capacities in their countries and in their hands to really play an important role and not to be like under the control of the Western countries. This is Lori Haitayan. She's an energy policy expert and looks at how oil and gas shape geopolitics in the Middle East. The politicians she's talking about are Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, the crown prince and prime minister of Saudi Arabia, and Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, or MBZ, the president of the United Arab Emirates. He's the ruler of the Emirate Abu Dhabi. Both recently took control in their country. They're completely different than their maybe fathers, grandfathers, the creators of these states. They came from a history of control of the Western countries over uh, these countries. Instead of depending on the West, the Saudis and Emiratis have been courting big Asian powers such as India and China and looking more towards countries of the so-called Global South. This is Camille Lance. She's an expert on geoeconomics in the Middle East. Her focus is on the ties between the Gulf states and China. We've seen uh, in the past really 10, 20 years of the, the willingness of, of the Gulf states to join some of the multilateral uh, platforms uh, that are non-Western uh, centric. Like BRICS. It's an economic alliance that is increasingly seen as a counterweight to more Western oriented forums, including the G7. BRICS is a pretty exclusive club. The leaders of Saudi Arabia and the UAE were asked to join the bloc last year. U.S. leadership at the, on the global stage is tending to, to erode. Uh, it's being increasingly challenged by new players, especially the Chinese. And so for the Gulf states, they are trying to adapt to, to the, this change and the, the growing multipolarity of the international order. This strategy is pretty new for Saudi Arabia and the UAE. For decades, they were very focused on the U.S. as their main partner. Basically, ever since oil was discovered in the Gulf in the 20th century. Just look at Dubai. This is what it looked like over 50 years ago. And this is what it looks like now. It's a similar story in Saudi Arabia. Its vast oil reserves completely transformed the whole Gulf region. And the U.S. was a key partner during that time. 
For decades, the two sides had an unofficial agreement. Oil for security. That cheap oil priced in dollars fueled the booming U.S. economy. In return, the U.S. provided security guarantees. Security guarantees matter when your main rival is just next door, Iran. Especially Saudi Arabia and Iran have historically both pushed to be the main regional power. The Gulf states and Iran adhere to two different branches of Islam, Sunni and Shia. Their rivalry is not just a, I mean, it's not just like a political one, it's a diplomatic one, it's an economic one, it's a, it's a religious one. Dina Esfandiari is an expert on Persian Gulf security relations. Iran aims to lead all Muslim Shias, while the Saudis aim to lead all, all Sunni Muslims. Um, so it's just, it was inevitable that these two countries would have this competition, would have this rivalry. The two sides are even fighting about wording. Take a look at this map. Google shows two names for this body of water, which the Gulf states are named after. It's commonly referred to as the Persian Gulf, after Persia, the historical name for Iran. The Arab states on the other side want it to be called the Arabian Gulf instead. But it's not just a war of words. The region has been plagued by conflicts and disputes, and many of them have been de facto proxy wars where Iran and Saudi Arabia are supporting two opposing sides, for example, in the civil wars in Yemen and Syria. Why do you need to know all this? Well, it gives you some context for why the Gulf states sought security guarantees from the US. So what do those look like in practice? The Gulf states let the US set up military bases across the region, giving them a foothold in the Middle East and securing their access to oil. The Gulf states bought weapons and other military hardware from the US, billions of dollars worth. For decades and through various wars, the partnership has been pretty useful for both sides. But since the early 2000s, political cracks have emerged in the relationship. One example, the Arab Spring uprisings of 2011, which swept through much of North Africa and the Middle East. U.S. President Barack Obama expressed support for the pro-democracy demonstrators, seemingly ignoring old loyalties to leaders in the region. Saudi Arabia and the UAE weren't amused. Then Obama signed the 2015 nuclear agreement with their regional rival, Iran. Things seemed to look up for the Gulf when Donald Trump took over the U.S. presidency, but that ended up being more show than substance. In 2019, Iran-backed rebels attacked Saudi Arabian oil facilities, said to be shown here. Trump didn't take any action. This was seen as proving the U.S. can't be fully counted on for security. To add insult to injury, Trump's successor, Joe Biden, snubbed Prince Mohammed of Saudi Arabia for several years. The rift emerged over the murder of this man, Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi journalist and fierce critic of the monarchy. In 2018, he was killed in the Saudi consulate in Turkey. On top of that, in the mid-2000s, the U.S. challenged the very foundation of the U.S. Gulf Partnership. It started fracking more and more of its own oil and gas. Uh, that has allowed the U.S. to reach almost a, a sort of a, a energy independence. Uh, and this has shifted quite a lot. The understanding that maybe actually uh, the Gulf states and, and, and the Middle East is not going to remain as important as it used to be for the U.S. Uh, energy security. The Gulf states are reacting to all these changes and to a global push to move away from fossil fuels. Both the Saudis and Emiratis have been investing big in renewables, presenting themselves as green frontrunners. The UAE even hosted the most recent UN climate conference. But neither country is actually quitting oil. In fact, they've been increasing oil and gas production and exploration. They are amongst uh, the countries in the world for, for whom the, pr the, the, the production of oil is the cheapest in the world. So they hope, and especially Saudi Arabia, hope to stay what they say the last man standing. So that the last, among the last producers of oil uh, in, uh, in the world. And they've found new customers for it. China and India have replaced the US as top buyers of Gulf crude oil. Their economic pivot to Asia and towards the so-called global south 
also gets rid of another headache. Human rights are a key issue that has come up time and again in meetings with Western leaders. China, on the other hand, has what it calls a non-interference policy on other countries' internal affairs. It basically means don't ask, don't tell when it comes to rights abuses. China develops friendly relations with all countries based on mutual respect and non-interference. OK, so China seems to be a pretty convenient business partner. But that still leaves the security issue. Remember the U.S. military bases in the region? Well, they're still there. But what's new is that the Saudis and Emiratis have been trying to expand military cooperation with China, too. These are images from Chinese state media. They show the country's biggest air show here in Zhuhai in 2022. The Saudis reportedly used the occasion to buy $4 billion worth of Chinese weapons. It's also sometimes, by going towards China, a way to keep the U.S. interested also in, in the Middle East. Uh, and, and, and this, this uh, kind of positioning has been already working quite well. The Gulf's strategy is to keep both the U.S. and China close, and it seems to be working. The U.S. is wary of growing Chinese influence in the Gulf. Cue Joe Biden's fist-bumping visit to Saudi Arabia in 2022. We will not walk away and leave a vacuum to be filled by China, Russia, or Iran. We'll seek to build on this moment with active principal American leadership. What does all this mean? The U.S. doesn't want to completely give up ties in the Gulf, and the Gulf states aren't willing to risk losing U.S. support either. Despite how frustrated they are with the United States, the U.S. remains their main security partner right now. Even if they have um, uh, purchased a lot of uh, advanced weapons from, from, the, from the U.S. and from other uh, uh, states, uh, their militaries remain quite underdeveloped, and they don't have at the moment the ability to to defend themselves. So let's recap a bit. When it comes to international partners, the Gulf states have a two-track approach. They're expanding ties with China and the Global South, but they're keeping their longtime security guarantor, the U.S., close. They find themselves having to play this really delicate balancing act where they don't really want to take sides. That pragmatic approach also extends to regional ties. The two countries have been trying to bury the hatchet on historical rivalries like with Iran and also with Israel. Their vision, creating stability for maximum economic growth. They cannot achieve that vision if they're fighting multiple front wars um, or they're stuck in, in tensions with countries um, in the region and outside. So this kind of no problem with your neighbors um, policy is one that they've been pursuing over the last couple of years. Which brings us back to these images, the Gulf states as mediators and middlemen. This is how they want the world to see them. Mediating gives them added credibility. It shows that they have these diplomatic and political credentials, uh, both inside the region and outside the region. Frankly, if you're a mediator, it looks good. But stability in the region seems to be on shaky ground. Hamas terrorist attacks on Israel and the Israeli bombing of Gaza have put the normalization of diplomatic relations with Israel on hold. And the Houthi rebels, a militia backed by the Gulf's other regional rival, Iran, are attacking ships in the Red Sea. The US and the UK are responding with airstrikes. In the future, too, Saudi Arabia and the UAE's attempt to position themselves between the world's powers may also mean ending up at the center of the world's conflicts.